Okay, so welcome to this uh, in-person discussion with Grumakerma and Lenny. And we're going to be talking about Koenig. Now, um, Koenig is a super interesting character who we're going to be getting into, an important figure in antinatalist history, who at the moment isn't really that well known about in general. And I've probably got the two leading experts in the world on Koenig um, sat with me here today. So thank you both for doing this. Thank you, Lawrence, for having us and for having come to Hamburg. No, thank you. Um, okay, cool. So let's get straight into, um, in both of your own words, who was Koenig? Um, Karim, do you want to go first and then Lenny can quickly go after? Well, Koenig is an extremely elusive, if I may say so, figure within um, antinatalism because we still haven't figured out who he actually was. Mm. We can tell who he was not, but um, we still haven't got a clue. Yeah, so Koenig was, like generally speaking, was a writer in the late 19th and very early 20th century who was heavily influenced by Schopenhauer. To me, he's definitely one of the most eccentric and intriguing figures in European literature that I have come across so far. And just to be clear, um, I think that he was not a particularly great writer nor a great thinker. I think he was more of a mediocre thinker who nonetheless held a number of very unconventional views, some of which might be considered uh, to have been far ahead of his time, others perhaps not so much. And he made some small but very significant contributions to the intellectual landscape of his time. And these contributions, I think, earned him the title of being the first antinatalist, first modern antinatalist in the, in the modern sense of the word. And if you ask Koenig himself who he was, he would probably say a, a cosmopolitan, a pacifist, philanthropic writer who is firmly in the pessimist tradition of Arthur Schopenhauer. Cool. So I know, Lenny, you've got um, a sort of you know, overview of his sort of life and bibliography you want to mm -hmm. go through. Um, so what okay. I'll do is let you go through that. Um, and then Kareem, if once Lenny's done, if you want to fill in any gaps that you see or anything you want to add. Um, but yeah, Lenny, do you just, do you just want to do your overview? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. So we don't know too much about Koenig and his own life, but we know for sure that he was active as a literary figure from 1894 until about 1918. So I think it is reasonable to assume that he was born sometime in the middle of the 19th century and died in the first half of the 20th century, sometime after the First World War. And his literary career can be roughly divided into two distinct periods. First, a theoretical or philosophical period from 1894 to about 1903 and then a practical or political period from 1904 to 1918. Now the first phase, which I called the, the theoretical or philosophical one, um, begins in 1894 where we have, as far as I am aware, the first sign of his uh, literary activity. And this was a short anti-militaristic book, or perhaps you could call it a pamphlet of just about 40 pages, which is called Völkerbund, nicht Völkerkrieg, which means League of Nations, not War of Nations, which was printed in August 1894 in Basel, in Switzerland, not under the pseudonym of Koenig, but under his previous pseudonym, Quartus. And in this book in this work he draws heavily on Schopenhauer's pessimistic diagnosis of the world and of life and its struggles and its futility as well as on, on more recent discoveries in Darwinistic uh, anthropology and drawing on these he presents a very bleak view on mankind and on the human predicament and he shows that the so-called civilized nations haven't come very far in their progress. So Koenig was strongly opposed to war and violence and murder and genocide, which is very important to point out, uh, especially now that we are kind of seeing antinatalist discourse slowly shifting to, you know, 
uh, to these kind of questions. And for Koenig, um, war is akin to crime and should be regarded as such, just on a much larger scale, but with similar anthropological roots. And um, for Koenig, this militarism, which was very like rampant uh, uh, at that time in Europe, uh, was really just a manifestation of primitive, brutish, uh, violent instincts. And in order to keep these violent inclinations and impulses at bay, he says it's extremely important to teach, um, you know, not to teach children to become soldiers, but to teach them in the spirit of peace and international cooperation. And this would become um, a very important uh, concern of his also later on, as we will see. So instead, he proposes to establish some kind of league of nations to replace the nation states and a new common uh, pacifist system of education. And this um, pamphlet was distributed um, like free of charge. And uh, what we can see here is already his kind of pessimistic diagnosis, but not yet a full-fledged antinatalist position with uh, the moral imperative. That came later. So in the year 1896, so two years later, at least three brochures or small uh, short pamphlets were produced, two in French and one in German under his now known pseudonym Koenig. And the first one, as far as I'm aware, from March 1896 was called Entvölkerung der Erde, das nicht sei nach dem Tode, ein neu nihilistisches Glaubensbekenntnis und Programm, which translates to depopulation of the earth, non-existence after death, a neo-nihilistic creed and program, which is a four-page pamphlet essentially outlining uh, his views and his, his core beliefs. And it is a call for human extinction through voluntary non-procreation for ethical reasons that are rooted in pessimism, philosophical pessimism. And he was clearly opposed to other uh, violent means of uh, extinction, including war and, and genocide. Uh, th and this is, as far as I'm aware, probably one of the earliest, if not the earliest instance of someone openly engaging in what we might call antinatalist activism today. Uh, so, but he also wrote um, two more pamphlets uh, in French, which, uh, just as, as a quick disclaimer, I have not yet been able to, um, you know, uh, examine myself, but I am in touch with uh, several libraries across Europe. And once um, I have these, I, I will try to make them available. Okay, so we're just going to take you away from the discussion for two seconds, because... Lenny mentioned that he hadn't been able to inspect these two French uh, pamphlets, but he's actually received them now from his endeavours with libraries around Europe. So, Lenny, I'm going to hand over to you to give us a bit more information from what you've learned. All right. So, in the meantime, I managed to obtain a high-quality scan of Koenig's French-language pamphlets. First, the one that's called Nouvelle Appréciation de l'instinct sexuel, A New Assessment of the Sexual Instinct. And this is a 12-page pamphlet, which is essentially an earlier draft of the work that he would go on to publish in the following year in German, The Sexualleben und der Pessimismus, Sexual Life and Pessimism. And the copy that I had was dated August 1896. And it was this pamphlet that was also mentioned in Rousseau's book La Greffe des Ventres uh, on Neo-Malthusianism in France. And although Rousseau gets a few things wrong about Koenig and the chronology of his work and activity. He also quotes two very interesting passages uh, from this pamphlet. First, it is by a ruse of nature that we are in the world. At the same time, however, in pitiful contradiction to itself, nature has endowed man with intelligence through which he has learned to discover ways of preventing procreation without sacrificing pleasure. So here Koenig argues in favor of a clear separation of the procreative instinct from the sexual instinct, which is uh, quite an innovation because for a long, long time, these two instincts, these two concepts were intimately tied together. And the second passage that he quotes is, 
Celibacy is, generally speaking, better than marriage, precisely because of the risk of procreation and madness, suicide, etc. In other words, the complete ruin of the individual himself as a result of his immoderation, his intemperance, are still better than procreation. That is to say, better than the perpetuation of our species and its suffering. So um, it's clear for Koenig that all kinds of personal hardship and even martyrdom, as he calls it, must be endured in order to avoid procreation. Yeah, the second one is called Philosophy Pratique or Practical Philosophy, Principles of Humanitarian Nihilism, Neo-Nihilism, which is a very short four-page pamphlet. And after, after a few short remarks about the badness of life, Koenig presents an impressively detailed list of commandments, a set of rules which he wants humans to abide by. And uh, this pamphlet came with an explicit permission, or perhaps even a request, to reprint it. So it's a bit of an, a bit of a bizarre thought. Imagine you got this pamphlet from an at the time completely unknown writer writing under a pseudonym, who believes himself to be the supreme moral authority, telling people what to do and actually expecting them to follow his orders and play by his rules. But again, I think we have to keep in mind that Koenig is not a philosopher. At least I wouldn't consider him a philosopher. He's not an author of some great works of literature. He was and has always been a writer of pamphlets, uh, an activist writer or if you want uh, a campaigner, so to speak. And unlike uh, Arthur Schopenhauer, for example, whom he idolized and almost quotes like, like Holy Scripture, Koenig didn't write with a particularly educated audience in mind. He really wrote for the common man, kind of the average Joe on the street. And he was even called a poor man's Schopenhauer by one of his critics. So <laughs> make of that what you will. <laughs> Cool. Okay. Thanks for that update, Lenny. So we'll go back to the discussion and then we've got another quick update that will be played later in the video. Now, from 1897 to 1999, Koenig published three more short works uh, in the publishing house of Max Spohr in Leipzig. And these were two volumes of Das Sexualleben und der Pessimismus, Sexual Life and Pessimism, and Der Pessimismus der Anderen, The Pessimism of Others. All of these were published, as I said, by Max Spohr in Leipzig and sold for a very small price, but printed in the city of Heilbronn am Neckar. And this uh, printing house in Heilbronn, in Heilbronn would serve as Koenig's kind of base of operations uh, for the next couple of years. And I would like to uh, talk a bit about kind of the literary scene and the literary circles um, Koenig moved in at the time because this is an aspect of his life and his career that hasn't really been discussed before. So a few words about this Max Spohr, the owner of the, of the publishing house. Max Spohr lived from 1850 to 1905 and he was one of the first publishers worldwide who published LGBT publications and along with people like uh, Magnus Hirschfeld he was one of, one of the pioneers of the early LGBT gay rights movement in Germany in the late 19th century, when homosexuality was still judged a criminal, uh, criminal offense uh, throughout the German Reich. And in 1897, which is the year of Koenig's first publication uh, with the publishing house of Max Bohr, Max Bohr himself and Magnus Hirschfeld, uh, and a few others founded the Scientific Humanitarian Committee that campaigned for the social and legal recognition of sexual minorities and campaigned against their prosecution. A number of authors who published uh, at this publishing house published under pseudonyms, so it was not just Koenig, and Koenig's work was actively read and discussed in other publications of that scene, which include the Annual for Sexual Intermediary Stages, as well as uh, the massive book, The Homosexuality of Men and Women by uh, Magnus Hirschfeld. And now who is this uh, Magnus Hirschfeld? He lived from 1868 to 1935. And he was also one of the pioneers of the emerging science of uh, sexology and later founded the Institute for Sexu Sexual Research in Berlin in 1919. In 1933, so a few years later, shortly after the Nazis took over in Germany, 
uh, this institute was looted and the, bur the books were burned and manuscripts were burned and years of unpublished research was burned and Hirschfeld was forced into exile in France where he died shortly after. Now we also know and we have proof that Koenig's work on this topic was also banned in some parts of the world and the copy that I used myself for my research um, had the name of the publisher, Max Bohr, physically removed probably by some wise librarian in order to save it from you know, the flames of fascism and the fate of the books of the likes of Magnus Hirschfeld and the other books published by Max Spohr. So what did Koenig publish um, at the time? His first work was called Sexual Life and Pessimism, the first volume uh, of, that, of that series. And there he um, expands on Schopenhauer's notion of this ruse of nature, this uh, essentially sexual pleasure perpetuating the cycle of birth and suffering and death. But he also sees non-procreation as a way to break this vicious circle. And what Koenig does is he kind of posits this as a moral principle. Do not procreate out of compassion for the unborn. This was a central thought to the work of, um, of Koenig. And he even makes it, later on, makes it some sort of commandment, like thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, and thou shalt not procreate, like under no circumstances. So he um, arrived at the conclusion that it is unconditionally unethical to create more people. And this marks a departure from Schopenhauer's um, proto-antinatalism, which we might uh, talk a bit mm. uh, about later. And what Koenig does is he says this does not necessarily happen through, through celibacy or complete abstention from all sexual activity, which he considered unrealistic for the vast majority, but through satisfaction of the sexual instinct in a way that does not result in the creation of a new human being. And Koenig claims that the underlying motivation behind engaging in non-procreative sexual acts is what he calls some sort of procreative pessimism or procreative nihilism. And from this point of view, homosexuals, for example, are kind of natural allies of antinatalists because they contribute to, to human extinction through non-procreation. And Koenig calls for a re-evaluation based on his pessimistic evaluation, pessimistic views of the affirmation or negation of life and its perpetuation. And uh, he calls for a re-evaluation of what is conventionally considered healthy by, you know, physiologists and psychologists and doctors of his times. And this would, of course, also have legal implications. So he calls for, like, equal legal treatment of homosexuals and heterosexuals and for more transparency, especially in cases of uh, sex offenses, especially ones that are connected to, to blackmail. But, and this is important, Koenig also clearly speaks out against all forms of uh, child abuse in this context. Then this work contains a critical commentary on Richard von Kraft Ebing's groundbreaking work, uh, Psychopathia Sexualis, which is considered one of the foundational works of uh, modern sexology and it contains um, a section with various thoughts on all kinds of things. On God, for example, Koenig was an outspoken atheist and didn't believe in any greater purpose or, or a life after death, as well as a list of his uh, commandments. Then one year later, in 1898, Koenig published a second part of his sexual life and pessimism, which consists of four dialogues so um, he introduces two fictional characters, two men, Matthias and Xaver, who discuss and praise uh, Koenig's views and always agree with each other. And, but they cover interesting aspects. So they um, talk about the history of philosophy, but viewed kind of through the lens of Koenig's views on procreation and on optimism and pessimism, as well as um, uh, the first reactions that emerged um, uh, to his work and he comments on, on these reactions. And there's also a famous passage um, where he describes 
a dream. One of the, these fictional characters describes a dream that the souls of the unborn implore us to double our efforts to spread Koenig's antinatalist uh, propaganda uh, in order to save them from coming into existence. Uh, yeah, and uh, this also um, uh, this second volume also contains a few more scattered thoughts on various topics. Uh, and we also see some of his attempts uh, at poetry, and as well as a translation of a passage from the Italian um, poet and philosopher Leopardi. Then the third work that he published in the publishing house of Max Spohr is called The Pessimism of Others. It's a slightly shorter one, it's about 28 pages, and it's a collection of about 300 quotes and expressions in German, uh, English and French that could be classified as pessimistic in the broadest and vaguest possible sense. Most of these, if not all of these, were taken from already existing uh, collection of quotes, collections of quotes. And uh, yeah, it's interesting to see that um, Koenig at that time, around the turn of the century, was actively being read and discussed. And he says that due to popular interest and demand, he put together a compilation of his previously published work. So in 1901, he published his book Der Neonihilismus, Antimilitarismus, Sexualleben Ende der Menschheit, which translates to Neonihilism, Antimilitarism, Sexual Life, The End of Mankind, which is an enlarged and slightly revised collection of his four previously published short books and has about 192 pages in total and also small, uh, sold for a very small price. So it's not a monography, it's more of a, the collected works of Koenig. And you know, a few more dialogues were added, um, two more interlocutors were introduced, Richard and Anselm, and a few more quotes were added to his collect, uh, collection of quotes. All right, and just another very quick update. It turns out that most additions to the second edition of the collected works of Koenig had actually been published separately the year before, including the four new dialogues and the replies to his critics. <laughs> I paid a fair amount of money to the Saxon State and University Library in Dresden for a scan of Koenig's probably self-published 19-page uh, pamphlet in Sachen Koenig's Neonihilismus regarding Koenig's neonihilism from the year 1900, which I've just received. And lo and behold, it looks like they're now adding it to the catalog of electronic resources. And you can find the link in the description. And one of the most um, like visually striking additions is that it also included a number of illustrations. And uh, what's interesting is also that a couple of passages that were in the previous editions mm. were not included in, uh, in this one, in the collected uh, works. And uh, that this book was also um, printed in a um, in a font known as Fraktur, which is some kind of black letter uh, font. This same book was republished about two years later, in 1903, um, together with an appendix um, uh, by the publishing house of Max Sengewald, who was an associate of Max Bohr in the town of Leipzig. And this appendix included some of Koenig's replies to his critics and a longer poem on the nature of the world. And in 1907, this book continued to be published, but not uh, anymore by Max Sengewald, by, but by Koenig, the author himself. So this was is kind of the first phase of um, Koenig's life. Mm. The second phase... Can I quickly ask a question about that? Uh, yeah. So, and also, Karim, if you have anything to add to anything that Lenny said as well, is you mentioned a few passages were removed from yeah. when he was sort of bringing his already written work mm -hmm. together. Were they about a certain topic or do you think he just removed them because his views had changed or what, what, what do you know what, what were those? So there was one pa uh, passage that I remember from um, his earliest work, the anti-militaristic work, and there were some lengthy passages on the topic of suicide, which were later taken out um, probably because they were no longer um, like representative of his views uh, on the topic and because they also heavily draw on um, Schopenhauer's metaphysical um, mm. ideas which kind of uh, Koenig later um, left behind. Right. Yeah. Or maybe a bit of self-censorship, you know, because he, maybe he didn't want his uh, philosophy to, be, to become conflated with any kind of suicidal philosophy 
Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. Do you want me to go on? Do you have anything <coughs> to add so far, Phil? Um I'd like to raise um, the question of where actually does Koine come from? Because... Um, you mean geographically? Not geographically, but um, if we talk about um, the overarching culture right, in which yeah. he must have existed. Yes, yeah. And if we take that into account, we have to take into account a publication by Malthus, mm. um, Principle of Population. Um, a book published in, if I'm not mistaken, 1798. And most of us know uh, the term Malthusianism. Mm. Um, Malthus wrote that book because he was of the opinion that while, um, while uh, agriculture only, um, because there is only a linear growth in agriculture, population growth is, um, is uh, geometrical, which is the difference between a curve like this, perhaps, and population goes up like this. So he said, we have to, we have to refrain from unlimited population growth. That is um, part of the overarching culture into which Koenig must have been born. Mm. Now, um, he must have lived decades later, but still he didn't come out of nothing. Um, he must have been prepared. And uh, in my view, antinatalism was like in the air in his lifetime or when he started to write, um, to write his essays and, and books. Um, one hint is um, a French poet called Henri Casalis. For a couple of weeks, I suspected Henri Casalis and Koenig are one and the same person mm. because both of them used pseudonyms. They were deeply interested in, in um, Oriental literature and culture. Um, Casalis was interested in Ara Arabic literature and in Hinduism. So was, so was Koenig. Um, but... Um, Obviously, Casalis died earlier than, than Koenig. Also interesting and intriguing, we ne scholars never managed to establish um, a concise biography for Casalis. So much for Casalis. Um, France's most prestigious literature prize is called Le Prix de, Grand de Goncourt. Uh, two brothers are the namesakes of that prize. And uh, they wrote a journal. In that journal, I guess in the year 1888, there is an entry in which one of the Goncourt brothers writes, there must have been in human history a sect who propagated the, instinct, the extinction of humankind by abstention from procreation. The year 1888. And... Uh, an alternative, um, one of the brothers Goncourt says, would be um, a gas developed by scientists, the inhalation of which would lead to a laughter, mm. whereupon um, the person in question would die painlessly. And using this, um, humankind by and by would die out. So, in other words, um, antinatalism was in the air, and uh, Koenig, one way or another, has not only been prepared by Schopenhauer, but by some other overarching um, mm. uh, cultural institutions and veins of thought. Yeah. So there were sort of like background influences that fed into producing Koenig. It wasn't like he, there was um, completely unfertile ground and he just happened to come out of nowhere. Yeah, he wasn't a singularity. Right, right. Um, Lenny, do you want to yeah. uh, continue with your... Okay, so I already um, discussed kind of the, the first uh, segment, uh, the first period um, of Koenig's literary activity. But then there's the second period. And perhaps seeing that his antinatalist or pessimist uh, mission uh, wasn't particularly successful, 
and also sensing the imminent threat of a great war. In 1904, Koenig uh, came up with and focused on a new project, and this is a plan already hinted at in his first anti-militaristic work from 1894, which is the foundation of what he called an International Educational Consulting Center or a Consultative International Center for Education, which, he said, will consist of delegates, two or three teachers or persons interested in education from each state, chosen by the government and the teaching profession, and they will devote themselves to the most careful examination of all matters connected with education and will issue printed reports of their discussions, Always, however, in the spirit of an attempt at international agreement and concord, with the goal, of course, of preventing wars between nations in the future. And Koenig himself said that he did not want to have any sort of function in this new institution or even be a member of it. He only wanted to make the foundation of such an institution happen. And once that's done, he would consider his mission accomplished. And around the same time, Koenig started sending out and distributing his so-called correspondences in order to win people over for his cause and essentially have them sign his uh, petition for the foundation of, of this new institution. And these correspondences were distributed free of charge from a publishing house in the city of Karlsruhe, also in Germany. And yeah, were published several times a year and the regular issues of these were numbered the highest number that I could find that I'm aware of um, is issue number 84 from September, October 1917. And what's uh, yeah, interesting about these correspondences is that they were both in German and in French, so bilingual editions, and um, consisted of frequent repetitions of Koenig's main points, especially regarding his concepts of um, pedagogy and his anti-militarism, excerpts from from his main work which we uh, discussed earlier as well as you know general news updates about his project and the state of the world and lists of new subscribers or as he calls them adherents and a lot of you know, clever illustrations to get his point across sometimes venturing into what we would call uh, meme territory today <laughs> so um and what's important to, to uh, note is that he, uh, he says that his philosophy that he called neo-nihilism, the idea that not being born is preferable to being born and so forth, that this is only his personal view and does not necessarily or does not at all affect the current project, his uh, educational project. So you don't need to be a pessimist in order to support it. So yeah, a few, word about, a few words about his target audience. So his correspondences were um, aimed at literally everyone, especially teachers, but also diplomats and government officials from all around the world, that is from Europe and Turkey and South America. Um, and all of these um, could actually be found among his lists of adherents. And Koenig explicitly says, one donkey driver from the Azores Islands who adheres is worth more from the point of view of civilization than a hundred decorated ministers of state who hesitate. So um, he also never asked for money. He just literally just wanted people to sign his petition and to, to spread the word. And a few statistics in July 1904, only three people um, uh, kind of supported his, uh, his mission. But this number grew to 2,500 people in September 1911. And by the end of his correspondence, so the last issue that I'm aware of was from October, November 1918, and there were about 3,900 adherents. And during the First World War, Koenig moved his base of, of, base of operations to the town of Zürich in Switzerland and found a new publishing house there. Um, which made sense, uh, especially given that Koenig's um, publications and his correspondences were actually banned in Germany for undermining, you know, the military ambitions. But he continued to publish his correspondences even during the First World War. And the last sign of activity that I am aware of um, is from, you know, from late 1918, so shortly after the end of the First World War. It's also noteworthy that uh, Koenig corresponded not only publicly, but also privately with a number of educationists and like-minded people, including one guy called uh, Ferenc Kemin, 
who was uh, a Hungarian educationist, and Friedrich Zollinger, who was the president of the Zürich Department of uh, Education. And Koenig was recognized as one of the forerunners of the International Bureau of Education of the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization. Uh, or UNESCO in short, and he was recognized as one of the foreigners in official UNESCO publications. So the, this Edu International Bureau of Education was founded in Switzerland, where Koenig resided, uh, in 1925 and was later incorporated into UNESCO. And a bit more research has been done on Koenig's um, efforts in this field. And by um, a guy called Pedro Rosselló, who was uh, the deputy director of the International Bureau of Education, and he wrote his doctoral thesis in French on the forerunners of the of this International Bureau of Education. And there's an entire chapter on Koenig, which is also available online. And there's even an abridged English translation of this chapter. So uh, in French, there are ten pages, and in English, there's just two pages. Um, and uh, during my research, I actually came across um, scans of this guy, Petro Rosselló's archives um, that he used for his, for his research, for his doctoral thesis. So there's now an extensive but still incomplete archive of Koenig's correspondences um, online, as well as um, scattered uh, you know, uh, across libraries all around the world. Cool. So um, thanks for all that, Lenny. One thing I wanted to pick up on um, coming to you, Karim, is you mentioned that Koenig's uh, work or correspondence had been banned in Germany. And I think you, you maybe mentioned that there were some other countries it was maybe banned in as well. In Russia, for example. Yeah. So I know we've spoken before, Karim, about how... Um, uh, at least I know in France, neo-Malthusianism, which is slightly separate from Malthusianism that you were talking about before, that became, uh, you know, at least a significant force in France around the turn of the uh, century and before, to the, and before the First World War. One of the key figures being someone like uh, Marie, I'm going to get her second name wrong. Uyo. Uyo. Um, and the French government actually banned neo-Malthusianism and imprisoned some neo-Malthusians. So, which sounds similar to banning Koenig's work. So can you speak a bit about, I know you already spoke a bit about the culture and Malthusianism, but what is neo-Malthusianism and, and the general culture around that? And why did governments want to start banning those ideas? Yes, of course, we have to be aware of the fact um, there was a war between Germany and France in 1870, 1871 which is to say France lost the war. Mm. Now, imagine um, people in your country uh, doing propaganda in favor of, of a depopulation mm. in diminishing the number of people. Of course, militaries and politicians uh, didn't like the idea of um, there being fewer French people, which would amount to having fewer soldiers. Mm. And uh, neo-Malthusianism um, mainly amounts to the idea that if we diminish the amount of people, um, on the one side, there'll be fewer wars. But then, of course, it was discovered as a means of, um, of uh, war bet between the classes. Mm. And it became a very important factor because some people as Paul Robin and uh, Colny, Madame Hugo, among others, we're going, we're going to discuss Madame Hugo, I guess, later on. Mm. So I'm not going to talk about Madame Hugo right now. Um, people discovered, anarchists discovered that um, if there are fewer workers, wages will rise. So uh, many people in Koenig's lifetime in France, um, propagated the idea to diminish pro propagation. And uh, it caused quite some uproar. Here I have a book written by Emile Zola, a famous French writer who wrote um, during Koenig's lifetime. He dedicated a whole book 
which translates as fertility. Um, 600, 700 pages a novel mm. about fertility. He was arguing against the Malthusian's idea of diminishing, diminishing the French population. And uh, against this background, Koenig also was attacked. According to Francis Ranzin, uh, somebody who dedicated a whole book on neo-Malthusianism, a book called um, The Birth Strike. Yeah, Lenny has it here. Yeah. A very interesting and all-encompassing book in which Koenig appears um, um, maybe four times. And uh, we're going to talk about that later. Um, so neo-Malthusianism was fiercely attacked by French mm. um, militants and by the French, by the French government, and also by writers such as Emile Zola, which um, is striking because it shows to us the power which antinatalism's predecessor, predecessors already had. Mm. At some point in time, uh, namely around 1870 and decades later on, antinatalism or antinatalism's um, pre-forms um, were extremely powerful and uh, for, they formed um, um, the overarching culture. And today, of course, antinatalism has lost much of that ancient uh, power. We're making a comeback, though. <laughs> yes, we're just about. <laughs> yeah. So, Lenny, I know that you f you first came across Koenig because you heard about it. You heard about him through Karim, right? I read it in um, Karim's uh, very interesting article in this collective volume edited by Katharina uh, Lochmanova, The History of Antinatalism. Yeah. yeah. But how did you, Karim, first come across? Um, by mere accident. By mere accident, I was reading a book on Eduard von Hartmann, a German philosopher mm. who is, in some aspects, is very similar to, to Schopenhauer. And um, I was interested in the question of whether or not we can consider Eduard von Hartmann as a proto antinatalist. So I studied a book written by Jean Claude Wolf. Um, a monography on Eduard von Hartmann. And finally, on page 24, there is a tiny note, the first note I ever saw on Koenig. And I thought, um, well, that's very interesting, somebody who is strictly against procreation. Mm. So I got a copy, I got me a copy in our Hamburg local library. And... Uh, there I found the first modern antinatalist, where modern antinatalist is amounts to non-metaphysical hmm. antinatalist. That must have been around the year 2015, because in 2015 I published my first article hmm. on Koenig on, in an in a, um, internet um, journal. So you've, you've mentioned two things there that I quickly want to ask about. The first is non-metaphysical. So what do you mean by Koenig's antinatalism was non-metaphysical? Well, why, uh, as Lenny said earlier, we can conceive of Schopenhauer as a proto-antinatalist. Um, he was still, his, his philosophy, his antinatalism was still overarched, overformed by uh, metaphysics in as much as Schopenhauer was a metaphysician of the will. He conceived of our world as um, an outcome of the blind will, which, um, which is reigning everywhere in the physical nature, in organisms, in our aim to procreate or in sexuality. Everything is overarched and driven by a blind will. Mm. Now, Koenig says... Um, he, um, he came to the conclusion we don't need the will, the blind will. He was a man of modern science. And he said there was nothing behind what modern science 
can explain um, brings to us. So his uh, modern antinatalism is Schopenhauer's antinatalism minus metaphysics. If mm. we distract the metaphysics of the will, we receive conic. Mm. We, we receive a conic type um, uh, antinatalism. So that explains the difference between a, a, a non-metaphysical, or the, sort of like the you know the metaphysics of Schopenhauer, and then the non-metaphysical antinatalist position of Koenig. But um, what makes you? And it seems like you both share this opinion that Koenig was the first real sort of modern antinatalist. Antinatalist in the sense that everyone watching this would understand, right? And how we all understand antinatalism. There is. Let me just. At this, there's a caveat. Mm. Um, earlier I mentioned um, the journal written by the brothers Goncourt. Mm. They also propagated, in a way, modern antinatalism. Or Henri Casalis, um, the French poet, in his poems, in his antinatalistic poems. But none of them dedicated a whole book, mm. a whole articles on the topic right, right. Uh, of antinatalism. So in a way, it's also a question of quantity. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so apart from the aspect of metaphysics, why, and Lenny, maybe you can go first and then Karim, if you want to add anything. Why, why is Koenig the first modern antinatalist? So as far as I understand it, um, he uses this view of traditional philosophical pessimism, this Schopenhauerian um, diagnosis um, of life and uh, and reality as his point of departure but then goes an extra step and arrives at um, at the conclusion that bringing new people into existence is unconditionally wrong it's not just a thought experiment um, it is not just um, a, a recommendation but for Koenig it is indeed um, a true moral duty, a negative duty that we have. So on the one hand, he identifies a problem, the problem of suffering, for instance, or the problem of the fut futility of human existence, and then presents antinatalism as a solution to that specific um, problem. It says, this is the way, this is what everyone should do, and in fact, this is a moral, um, moral duty. So um, he is very um, explicit in, in saying this, and this is made possible by the, by the technological um, advancements uh, of, its, of his age. For example, the invention of um, uh, reliable and safe uh, contraception, for example, which if you want to have a discourse on procreative ethics, this discourse must be enabled in the first place. And I think that's one of the enabling conditions. Also, we must keep in mind that um, Koenig wrote in a different so-called existential mood, which is a term coined by um, philosopher Emil P. Torres. And because at the time of Koenig, um, human extinction was already something that was indeed conceivable for thousands of years it was not actually really um, uh, conceivable it was like a pa paradoxical um, idea to, 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 to most people and um, but at the time of Koenig um, Darwin's uh, um, uh, observations were already like um, becoming mainstream uh, in, in anthropology and so people realize that human extinction is in, is possible and it's inevitably going to happen because at the same time the second law of thermodynamics was also um, uh, had already been discovered and uh, we realized that human beings or humanity is not all that special from an evolutionary standpoint like other species have gone extinct and we are not protected by any kind of divine uh, force, but uh, we will meet the same fate as any other species that has gone extinct already. So, so this is definitely a factor. And the fact that he considers this um, uh, not only feasible, like he insists on the, the feasibility of, you know, uh, the, the, of pr practicing antinatalism, um, and therefore he must also consider um, human extinction and he does this, and I mean, as an antinatalist, one can have 
uh, very different and nuanced views on human extinction. But um, Koenig says, yes, if everyone um, adopted the antinatalist uh, mindset, as, as he would hope, then yes, this would mean that the human race would go extinct and that this would be a good thing. So he kind of checks all the all the boxes um, mm. of uh, of a, an antinatalist in the modern sense of the word. And Karim, do you have anything to add to that? Because I have another question to ask you. Yes, of course. Um, also here, we have to be aware of the fact that um, France in the, in the 1860s, 1870s, or maybe even earlier on, um, was declining as regards its population. And also here, Koenig falls on fertile soil. And uh, somewhere I've read, maybe in Rancin's book on Neo-Malthusianism, that um, in England, in the United Kingdom, uh, when a couple had only two children, they called it a French family. Because five children at that time uh, were usual. But in France, um, due, to, due to people's becoming ever clearer of um, the ethical problems of too many children, and also of precursors of modern uh, contraception, um, there were ever fewer children. Um, for example, a so-called Pesarus, I don't know the English word for it, was an early um, instrument, uh, an early contraceptive used um, widely in France. So two children rather than five were normal at Koenig's time and even, maybe even decades, decades earlier. So um, we've been talking about why he, why you think he's the first modern antinatalist, and we've been using the term antinatalist, but he used the term neo nihilismus. Mm -hmm. Is there a difference between what we mean by antinatalism and what he meant by neo nihilismus, and or can they literally just be swapped like for like? I guess um, his shortest explanation of the term. Neo nihilism is uh, neo nihilism is a correction of nature. He gives a very precise definition. It's a correction of nature because nature actually forces us or prods us, nudges us into ever more procreations. But here Koenig says nature. Now he speaks as if nature were a subject. Nature mm. committed a mistake because nature provided us with um, reason and understanding, such that we are able to contravene nature as if it, as, as if it were a subject, um, aspirations. And uh, in the end, we are able to bring about what he calls a complete exodus from being. Uh, I published a book in the year 2000, which is called Ebbing Away of Mankind. In 2015, by, I became aware of the fact there is a much better expression, much better, exodus from being, and it's called it's Koenig's expression, and we should keep it in mind. So, if I may, a few things about this. So, yes, of course, uh, the term antinatalism was not used by Koenig himself, and of course, we got to be extremely careful when you know applying our labels to people in different ages and cultures and mm. especially when we're trying to establish some sort of like retroactive uh, continuity between them and you know the present day and it's also worth noting that Koenig uses the term nihilismus or nihilism a bit differently from um, how we are used to seeing and usually it means like the denial of the existence of things like moral values or, or of meaning or of truth but for him um, it means something else. So nihilism is derived from the Latin word nihil, which means nothing. And nihilismus, nihilism for him, is some sort of nothingness advocacy. So the idea that non-existence is preferable to existence. And in the context of procreation specifically, so procreative nihilism, if, if you will, means that it is better not to um, create uh, another being into existence. So um, 
And that's kind of what, where the nihilist uh, part comes from. And he uses the prefix neo to show that there had been earlier traditions of this. And he um, says that Buddhism and Christian early Christianity also pointed towards a, a similar idea. But he now as an outspoken atheist, as a materialist, as a um, secular um, person kind of... Um, comes up with a with a new and revised version of of these uh, ni he as he calls them nihilistic traditions. So what is also striking about Koenig, he uses a lot the the term procreate, which for English speakers is a normal word, I suppose. Whereas um, in today's German, it, it's a rather unusual word. You wouldn't use procreate. You can say procreieren in German, but To us, I guess, it sounds a little bit weird. We would say Fortpflanzung. Exactly. Whereas Koenig uses procreate a lot. So he was, he almost hit a term, an alternative for antinatalism, anti-procreationism. It was left to another French thinker. His name is Anava. It's a pseudonym. Apparently many Many an antinatalist uses yeah. pseudonyms. Yeah. So did um, the French Anaba. Behind this pseudonym is another name, um, Philippe Bellot. And he talks about um, anti-procreationism, anti-procreationism. So in a way, it looks like, in hindsight, um, there could have been a term established by Koenig already, uh, which would have served as a tool mm. to concentrate um, the meaning and to convey the meaning in much better fashion than perhaps the word neo-nihilism. Mm. Yeah, it's slightly misleading uh, given how the word or the yeah. term nihilism is used today. Yeah. yeah. Um, Lenny, I've also got down here that you want to talk about other similarities he had with modern antinatalists. Do you want to do that or do you want to go on to the next question? Oh, give me a, sec a few seconds. So what is interesting to note is that Kooning has a lot in common with kind of modern antinatalists, not so much with um, other philosophers of his time, but with kind of modern antinatalists as they are found, for example, On the internet so much so that the more I learn about Koenig and the more I read from him and about him I get the impression that he was really just an online internationalist trapped in the wrong uh, century so as Karim already mentioned um, Koenig used a pseudonym because he was very concerned about his uh, his privacy like yeah. we know from from David did, did he also use an anonymous anime character <laughs> <laughs> He used a lot of illustrations, yeah. <laughs> and um, so this is definitely uh, uh, something that we find today too. And then also a sort of um, very dogmatic approach to to his um, to his ideas. So Koenig kind of considered himself, um, you know, to be smart and enlightened enough to find the holy truth, and that now that he has found it. Um, He wants to share it with anyone in the world and urges everyone to, to spread the word and kind of um, uh, subscribe to his ideas. And he wasn't actually interested in having um, discussions or making compromises or anything. He just wanted to, to win people over for his cause. So he was kind of a man on a mission and he like really wanted to, to change the world and actually believed he could... Um, change the world, like could prevent a war by writing his correspondences and could, you know, uh, initiate uh, uh, the voluntary extinction of mankind, which to us might seem a bit deluded, but um, uh, nonetheless, uh, he was very, very serious um, about his concerns and he kind of considered himself to be in a, some sort of fight or even a war against uh, optimism and he strongly stood on the pessimist side and kind of if you want he, he kind of turned Schopenhauer's views and Schopenhauer 
Schopenhauer's pessimism, try to turn it into some co sort of, of cause to rally behind. So this is definitely something worth noting. Also, as I mentioned earlier, his, uh, his illustrations, which make him a bit of a meme lord <laughs> ahead of his time. And also the fact that um, when he turned to actual activism, that there's a, a change of objectives, because he noticed that with his pessimistic or neo-nihilistic ideas, he wasn't being particularly successful, so he kind of focused on on pacifism and education in, to, in order to, to be more successful. And uh, yeah, kind of, we can already see here that um, kind of right from its beginning, there's a certain kind of optimistic um, notion um, that separates antinatalism from other strands of uh, philosophical um, pessimism, because he really believed he could change something, he could achieve something by, by spreading the word and sharing his views and, you know, stating his opinions. And funnily enough, um, Les Unite, the, who calls himself the finder of the voluntary human extinction movement, uh, actually refers to Koenig as the actual founder of the human extinction movement. Voluntary human extinction movement. Yeah. Let me perhaps put in here um, an observation regarding Koenig's view on religions. Mm. That is also um, a contribution to Koenig's optimism, because he actually was convinced, even without our contribution, the world is, is already about to commit an exodus from being. Because in his view, two religions, um, Buddhism, as he called it, and uh, Brahmanism, which is more or less tantamount to what we today call Hinduism. In his view are religions that are about to lead to the extinction of two third, thirds of the world population. In his view, um, uh, Buddhist, Buddhism and Hinduism are religions which lead to mankind's disappearance disappearing from those territories in which uh, Buddha, Buddhism and Hinduism are the most important religions. Now, we know far from, far from that. Um, <laughs> he today, was really wrong on India. He was really wrong <laughs> on India. And all, he's also wrong. He was also wrong on, on, on Buddhism because um, actually uh, the, the Buddhist laymen and laywomen um, more often than not, do have children. Mm. And uh, in the Hindus, in one of the Hindus law book called uh, the Book of Manu or Manu's Manu Rules, um, it is prescribed for the serious Hindu to have a son. And then, of course, uh, we have the question of the importance of rebirth and uh, the question of how to improve one's rebirth we have, as regards Buddhism, the question of whether or not there is a soul, because a soul, because actually there is no soul in Buddhism. So, as opposed to Koenig, unfortunately, it has turned out very differently. But he was convinced that without our antinatalists' contribution, the world is already on track. Mm. So. When uh, Koenig published work pertaining to antinatalism or neo-nihilism, he got responses to his, his work, right? And he responded to those responses as well. Yeah. Um, what, where, where did those responses come from? Did they come from a certain type of person? Where did they come from? And what were those responses? Was it purely negative? Was there some positive? What was all that like? So um, his work was sent out, possibly also by himself, because he really wanted um, people to read his work and to discuss his work, um, was sent out to various magazines and journals and newspapers, some of them being like specialized, for example, medical or psychi psychiatric um, journals, but also journals about literature and philosophy, pedagogical uh, journals, even law journals, as well as daily newspapers, as long as they offered um, a section on, on book discussions. And um, so the, the response was generally, I mean, the response was very mixed, but his work was mainly received um, not particularly well. 
uh, some uh, reviewers simply uh, kind of restated or summarized his main points. Uh, there were also some some mischaracterizations of him. Um, some claimed that he was advocating uh, celibacy and complete sexual uh, abstinence. And one reviewer even called him a representative of what he called eunuch literature. <laughs> <laughs> but um, others simply outright uh, refused to review it. Like we, see, we received this book, but we don't want to talk about it here. Um, some. Um, uh, of course, uh, most most reviewers um, disagreed um, with him. With, with him, some were amused by what he wrote. Uh, others considered him to be uh, well intentioned, but uh, kind of a misguided or even delusional uh, dreamer. Um, one called him the most extreme philosopher of pessimism, and one that I found really funny <laughs> called him a, a toxic mushroom of pessimism. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, some some were more favorable, called him, well, it's a bit bizarre, but it contains some truth and def definitely gives us uh, some, some food for thought. Others gave him some unsolicited advice, like turn to God or find a more promising course. Uh, one called him a traitor to the fatherland because um, Koenig w uh, believed in pacifism and in international cooperation, so he was accused of sympathizing um, with France, for example. Um, but others uh, endorsed him and wished him good luck with his, especially with his pacifist um, activism, which seemed to be like more more agreeable and more successful than his pessimism activism. And there was one review that uh, actually said. Earlier we didn't take this guy seriously, but but now now we should now he's onto something, and uh, there was also a, review, a couple of reviews that took great issue with Koenig's uh, atheism, which was far from being as accepted back then than it is today, and you know ex uh, accused him of blasphemy and said, look, this is what what a what a lack of faith can lead to. Um, yes, right. And to me, it was striking when I first read um, um, the reviews he received, how many reviews he actually received. Because if today one of us would write a book on antinatalism, we could only dream of the number of reviews he got. Mm. And uh, strikingly and interestingly, he received many reviews from medical journals, which is to say, somehow his ideas were taken seriously because it wasn't um, the desperate uh, student who wrote a review on Koenig, but established mm -hmm. people, which is striking and which um, leads, could lead us to say that in, in his time, antinatalism was taken perhaps as seriously or even more seriously than today, which I find is very interesting, but we maybe have to do more research on how seriously actually uh, his antinatalism was was taken. But if if we if we um, take into account the fact that as, at his lifetime there was no internet, then definitely at his time his antinatalism, one person yeah. was taken more seriously then it is antinatalism is uh, discussed today. Mm. And a few more words about the internet. I said earlier that I believe Koenig was an, an online antinatalist trapped in the wrong century. And if if he could, he would definitely make uh, use of, of the internet. And he is the kind of person that would reply to every single comment that he received. So he was the kind of person that always wanted to, to kind of have the last word and, you know, engage in, 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 these, uh, in, these, in these sorts of debates and even pay for advertisements um, uh, on, on social media. So, so I think that's also the reason why he chose, he explicitly says that he chooses the medium of the written word because that way he can reach a lot of people. Yeah. And I think um, if given if he had the chance uh, with today's technology, then um, he would have definitely uh, used, you know, would have sent newsletters via email and used have used social media. Yeah, 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 yeah. Be before we broached the question, or we mentioned um, that Koenig sent many of his pamphlets to to teachers, mm. and of course um, the question arises arises why, 
And I guess the answer is to be found in the context we are discussing right now. Namely, it was his aim to, if you like, sissify if our culture, yeah. to soften our culture. To what, what, uh, Can you explain what sissify means? Because I think people may not he, know that. Yes, yes, of course. Um, he was against militarism and uh, the normal cause of things would always be to educate ever more soldiers. So he wanted to establish a culture that um, makes people, especially males, softer. Mm. So that, um, an acquaintance, an English acquaintance of mine uh, coined the word sissify. I don't know if, it, if, it's, if it's a good term. It, uh, it sounds girlish, like to pacify. It, to make like, it girlish, it's yes. To soften up. Okay. To soften up, uh, to sissify, right. to make girlish um, the general culture. Therefore, he sent many of his pamphlets to, to teachers because um, apart from having Buddhism mm. and Hinduism as tools to bring about um, an exodus from being, he wanted a complete change in education, namely by softening up, um, sissifying, uh, especially boys. But is, and this does mean like turning boys into uh, girls or like giving administering some sort of hormonal treatment to them. Yeah, it's yeah. just um, raising them not to be um, soldiers, but to be like kind and decent, uh, civilized um, people. And um, in order to and uh, kind of uh, work together towards a gentle depopulation of the earth. Mm. Some of his ideas in this context are really weird from today's point of view, maybe, because he was going as far as saying we perhaps also have to refrain from physical education because um, physical, educa physical education um, delivers strong people, um, bold people, people uh, especially males, which are perhaps prone to, to, to the military. So therefore he recommended to refrain from physical education and from sports in, right. in general. But this is where you can find traces of um, kind of Schopenhauer's uh, views on uh, affirmation and negation uh, of the world to life. Mm. Yeah. So you've already mentioned that he wrote in a variety of languages. German so, and like, French yeah, primarily. primarily. Yeah. And, and there is a small amount of his writing in English, mm -hmm. originally written in English, rather than having been translated, you know, in, in the modern context, right? What are the prospects of getting either neo nihilismus or any of his other work translated into English? I know, Lenny, this is more pointed at you because I know you're actually mm -hmm. already working on this. So, yes, when I read um, Karim's article on Koenig, I immediately realized that much more research needed to be done on the guy and I thought it would be kind of cool if we had an, an, an easily accessible uh, text of this very very obscure book and uh, given that no one else was going to do it I thought okay then I'm going to produce uh, this text myself which took a couple of weeks and um, when I published it uh, like Online, at, at first, there were not so many reactions because there's a tendency that online antenatalists uh, are generally more interested in reposting low effort memes and, you know, complaining about so-called readers and just venting their frustrations. But then people started reaching out to me. Uh, Will, uh, William White, uh, the, the famous uh, and composer reached out to me and said, hey, I was actually working on something similar. And then Mr. Conundrum uh, reached out to me, helped me out with a couple of illustrations and said, hey, Lenny, don't you want to join my, my Discord server? And then people started requesting, hey, what about a translation? And uh, I, I started working on a translation first in cooperation with a couple of people, but uh, then later kind of behind the scenes. So yeah, I'm actively working on a, on a translation now, but my main focus is to produce a critical edition of uh, of the text so um, I think this is uh, required uh, if you want to do some more serious research uh, mm. on him that you have a 
well edited uh, and reliable and complete text that also conforms to uh, the standards of mm. textual criticism and, and philology and that this text can then serve as a basis for for further literary, historical and, and yeah. philosophical research. So that ha has been kind of my focus, but um, uh, uh, I want, my plan is to, to um, edit it in a, um, or publish it in a bilingual um, edition. So it'll be available in German and English? Correct. Right, just to be clear with people. Um, okay, cool, That that's cool. And. I know obviously, you know, it's an ongoing thing, you can't put a hard date on it, but I'm assuming we could expect that to maybe happen in the next one or two years, something yeah. like that. So it's definitely going to take some more time and uh, for things like this, it's always been uh, precision over, over speed for me. And uh, I also need to track down a few more of his, uh, um, of his, of his pamphlets. I'm currently in touch, as I said, with a couple of libraries uh, in France. Um, to see if I can get hold of these uh, missing uh, pamphlets. And I also am trying to track down the original reviews of his work that he then later replied to. So for context that we have the, the responses at hand and not just his side of the story. Mm. And so, yeah, uh, a bit a bit more time is definitely required. Yeah. yeah. Um, thanks for letting us know about that. So I actually I wanted to go back now to something we mentioned earlier. And we were talking about the context that he exists in, in terms of Malthusianism, Neo-Malthusianism, and the fact that that was becoming clamped down on. And there were other figures that were also promoting not exactly the same message, but a similar message. And we mentioned one particular person who was French, a woman called Marie Yu. And um, I wanted to ask you, Karim, who was she? And also just for context for people, I'm currently working on a video specifically on Marie. Um, but who who was um, who was Marie and what was her relation to Koenig or, or what information do we know about that? Because I know it's not fully known at the yeah. moment. Uh, first of all, what did she look like? It's only a couple of days ago I purchased a book on Marie Eau. Um It's available in French only and there is no ebook avail available, so I had to order it in, in France. And um, Marie Eau is one of the most fascinating and perhaps important persons mm. um, as regards Koenig. She is mentioned in uh, Francis Rancin's book on Neo Malthusianism as uh, a woman who was at the same time an antinatalist, a feminist, a animals rights activist and an anarchist. But she left behind Neo-Malthusianism mm. since Neo-Malthusianism Neo only wanted to restrict, to diminish uh, the birth rate in order to make it possible for workers to ask for higher wages, she asked for a complete cessation of all birth. She gave a seminal lecture in the year 1892, yeah. in which she... In Paris. In Paris, yeah. um, at the Société Géographique, Géographique, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. in that lecture, she already asks for what Koenig later on, or at the same time, um, labelled the exodus from from being. And uh, yes, thank you for pointing at her essay, Le Mal de Vivre, yeah. a tiny essay consisting of just about 20 pages. And I, ju I just want to say for the benefit of, of the viewer, it's actually really cool that Karim has a physical copy of this because there's only a few of the... I, I, I'm sure at the time there were maybe, you know, a few hundred, maybe even a couple of thousand of these produced. But, you know, these things get lost, yeah. you know, they're paper as well, so it's degradable, all this sort of stuff. So it's actually really cool that you've got an actual physical version yeah, of this. Just, just as a relief, uh, the tiny essay is contained as an addendum in this book. 
But so, who was Madame Guyot? She gave a seminal lecture in the year 1892, which got later published as Le Mal de Vivre, um, the it's the pain of living. Pain of living. Yeah. Very good translation. Thank you. And um, earlier on, she had already been active as an animals activist. There is a famous story, according to which uh, in the 1880s, she attacked with her umbrella mm. a professor who um, operated on live animals. Some people say rabbits, mm. others say apes. I couldn't figure out um, whether it was mm. rabbits or uh, apes. Anyway, mammals, sentient mm. mammals who must have experienced pain and i believe without anesthetic as well as i've seen reported yeah of, of course of course without anesthetic and she was she was she was a very knowing woman and uh, it shows to us um, the animal rights movement didn't begin in the last centuries 70s but approximately 100 mm. years earlier what is more important um Marie Huyot shows to us that more often than not, um, there is an attraction between antinatalism and a compassion for animal suffering, which yeah. is very important. And I this think. goes back thousands of years as well. Yes, there are interruptions, but then uh, perhaps a lost thread was taken up again by, my, by Marie Huyot. And uh, just imagine what it must have taken to as an as an as an as a lone standing woman to attack a famous professor in front of the eyes of an audience mm. with an umbrella so she's a very audacious woman at the same time she was an anarchist and she was she was arguing and fighting for workers rights and for women's rights um, all in all she is a, a role model mm. to all of us and I, for, for a few days, just a few days, I suspected Marie Huyot and Koenig could have been one and the same person. But <laughs> that would have been very, a twist. <laughs> very, soon, very soon I left this admittedly somewhat crazy, crazy, <laughs> crazy idea. Uh, because, let me add this, Koenig, mm. Koenig um, it looks like Koenig wasn't an animal rights activist, because in one of his responses, he ridicules um, one of his reviewers. There is a short dialogue between between um, the diet and the consequences, the mental diet, men mental consequences of diets, mm. and Koenig and his re reviewer ridicule each other. Whereas Marie Yo, um, she is beyond um, some of the deficiencies of Koenig. So maybe one day we will even have to to uh, name her the first um, modern antinatalist, were it not for the fact that she never left um, a complete monography on the topic of antinatalism, mm. except for his for his tiny yeah. essay. So a very interesting uh, woman. And we need to do more research and, um, about her. And what was her relation with Koenig? Apart from that they, you know, existed yeah. at the same time and shared yeah. similar ideas. Very good question. Very important question. Because according to Ranzin and his book on Neo-Malthusianism, let me add, Ranzin, um, he died, apparently, he died, yes, he died in the year 2019. And I'm afraid he took some of his of his secrets to his grave. So, so there is no possibility anymore to ask him mm. how deep actually was the relationship between Madame Yo and, and Koenig. Mm. But according to his book, um, Madame Yo, Marie Yo, was heavily influenced by Koenig, even though her ideas, um, she, it, it looks like, like she found her ideas well before the 18. 90s. Okay, so I've got um, two questions left. The second to last one was I wanted to cover 
who was Koenig as like a a personality on the personal side of things mm-hmm. rather than his ideas? What who was he as a personality? And can we speculate anything about his profession at all? So of course we know very little because he took great care not to uh, reveal too much about himself and his identity. But there are a few things that we know for sure. For example, that he was proficient both in German and in French. And it is probable that German was his native language and French was his second language. He also he was able to read um, English and at least some Italian because he translated uh, Leopardi himself into German. But I think I can show that he had very little, if any, uh, knowledge of um, Latin and Greek, which is quite uh, surprising for a man of his time. Before the First World War, uh, people were generally considered to be educated if they were able to read Homer in the original. So this is definitely something um, that puts him apart from highly educated thinkers like Schopenhauer, for example. We also know for sure that he was reasonably well off financially, given that A large portion of his work was largely, if not self-published, then at least self-financed and, you know, distributed all around the world. And he never, not even once, asked for donations. Uh, In fact, his name was actually included in a uh, 1917 list um, to, to the library in Zurich. And money was not an issue for him at all, and this, this was even remarked upon by by one of his uh, one of his critics. So, when you say his name was included in the in the library, do you mean as a donor? As a donor, right? right. Yeah, right. And we also know that he travelled um, a lot. Uh, uh, we know that he travelled a lot to um, to to Italy, for example. That is, he sent postcards to his uh, critics and supporters from from Rome. So this is kind of confirmed. And we know that he traveled a lot throughout Europe, except, as he says, for Andorra and Liechtenstein. But other than that, he has been to every single European country. And we know that he traveled to Asia, that is to Turkey, um, to Israel, China, India and Sri Lanka and um, Africa. So he was um, definitely a well-traveled person. And I think it is reasonable to assume that his profession might have required him to to travel a lot. So I venture the the guess that he might have been perhaps a a businessman uh, that that, uh, traveled a lot around the world. Let me perhaps um, add here that um, Henri Casalis, the French poet, he was a Koenig type person because he 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 was a doctor. He was a doctor. Madame Huyot, of whom we spoke, um, we just spoke. She also traveled to Asia, which at her time was very rare. Women traveling to countries such as such as such as India, and uh, it looks like there must have been a Koenig type of human existence, because there are so many similarities between Koenig, Madame Yo, and Henri Casalis. So we might even suspect that Koenig, Koenig was a doctor. Um, Very he tried to outreach not only to teachers, but also to, to physicians. Because he says it's the physician, not the priest, who is next to the dying. And who is next to what Koenig calls um, the catastrophe of mm. dying. Because it was Koenig who was extremely aware of the fact that our dying is more often than not a catastrophe so we might suspect him to be to have been a medical doctor in the same ma- manner as perhaps as indeed Henri Casalis mm. also was a medical doctor and um, why are you skeptical of that Lenny? so i think that is more of a um, unconfirmed factoid that has been uh, repeated a number of times even in the book of um, Jean-Claude Wolf mm-hmm. And the reason I doubt is, is um, because he is, Koenig is more of a, a dilettante, uh, an amateur. So he writes about a lot of things, but he is, he is not an expert uh, on the subjects that he writes about. He, so he 
does engage with them, but not on a particularly deep or professional level, whether it's uh, anthropology or education or sexology or law or religion or philosophy. He seems to have only, uh, I mean, his, his, his knowledge and grasp and understanding of these subjects seems to be rather limited. So he, he does a bit of everything, but nothing really um, uh, thoroughly. And I think that... Um, uh yeah this was also like not noticed by by his critics of course and um the fact that his work was actively discussed in medical uh, medical uh, circles and journals might have to do with um kind of the the focus of the publishing house of um of Max Spohr, which dealt much more with things like um uh sexual ethics, uh, sexuality, uh, psychiatry, and so forth. Yes, but then, of course, um, Koenig's mental grid, if I may say so, um, um, allows us to put him squarely in the medical profession. Because only 50 years ago, at least in Germany, mm -hmm. it was doctors who were very often well-educated well, He was people. not well-educated. Okay, you say he was not well educated. Um, well, I would say he was he was moderate, at least moderately mm -hmm. well educated. Mostly self taught. Namely, in a way in which many, some f fifty or forty years ago, um, physicians were people who were well educated, more educated than many other professions. Mm. So. Either way, it's unconfirmed what his profession would have been. So Definitely. all we can do is yeah. speculate. But we know that he travelled a lot. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And he was well off financially. Yes. Um, and he was more educated than the average person. Exactly. But, it, but he wasn't an Einstein but, or anything But less like that. educated than his critics. Right, okay. <laughs> that is a specialist. Yeah, exactly, critics. exactly. Yeah, precisely, yeah. yeah. So right. in a way, he was even more educated than his critics because he was encompassing many topics. Right. But not on, a, on their level, of course, in the respective uh, topics. Right. So he had a breadth of knowledge, mm -hmm. but on specific topics, he wasn't the deepest of... Yeah, sometimes he just read one or two books on the subject. Right, okay. He was an Oswald Spengler type. Intellectual, if you like. Who's that? Oswald Spengler is, um, well, he was um, a, a German um, historian who wrote about the decline of, um, of the West. Okay. And uh, he received many reproaches, you are no specialist, because he was write, writing about natural science, sciences, yeah, art yeah, and history. Yeah. So Koenig is a type of yeah. Spengler intellectual. Okay, so I've got one last question and then I'll open up the floor to either of you to add anything that you think we've mm -hmm. missed throughout the whole discussion. So clearly we know a decent amount about Koenig, um, but there's still many unknowns. But we know that his writing and also him as a person he was clearly a significant figure in his time and he's worth researching more on. Yeah. Absolutely. So it's worth the antinatalist community or even someone who's just interested in him, who's not even an antinatalist, finding out more about him Definitely. Right, as a figure yeah. And, yeah. and as a writer. How do, obviously you, you two both have an interest in Koenig and both will presumably in the future be part of the group of people that finds out more about him. But if there are people watching who think this Koenig guy is really interesting, I want to help be part of the you know, effort mm -hmm. to find out more about him. How do you think people can go about contributing to that effort? And what are the most promising leads that we have at the moment? Yeah, what we, what we should do, we need more knowledge about what was going on in the vast new Malthusian, Malthusian literature at Koenig's time. Because there were people such as Paul Robin, uh, Colony, who contributed to um, the discussion. Hmm. They published books and uh, I'm very sure in their books we will discover um, contributions to what we today call antinatalism. 
and uh, reading those books will enlarge our knowledge and we may even find traces of Kornig in mm -hmm. some of these many books. Because just to quickly add on to that before you go, Lenny, one interesting thing is, is that there is a, uh, so um, I'll explain more of this in my video when on, on Marie, but uh, she has an entry in a book on Neo-Malthusianism where she talks about how she thinks her lecture that she gave has kind of been forgotten, but there were other people who took up the same sort of extreme form of Neo-Malthusianism the more sort of anti-natalistic type and continued on that fight as it were that that mm -hmm. message now i suspect one of the people she's talking about was koenig but she unless there's something being lost in translation she seems to be referring to multiple people so i agree with you the more the more that's looked into this we may find more people who are actually expressing anti-natalist views yeah. rather than that more sort of watered down political form of neo yes. there are many many forgotten authors which we have to rediscover. Mm. Sorry, Lenny, you weren't going to... So, one thing that I would, if someone is uh, uh, interested in, um, you know, Kuhn ecology, uh, I would recommend, like, checking um, out his uh, correspondences. As I mentioned, there's a, um, a large... Um, a collection of uh, of scans of this of these correspondences but these are incomplete nonetheless you might find fami uh, familiar names um, in in his lists of uh, of subscribers and you might also check in your local um, libraries if there are more uh, correspondences of his because these were really distributed all around the world and um, so chances are that there's something uh, somewhere and that might help us uh, get a more complete um, picture of his of his life and of his uh, influence. Mm. So this is one thing. And um, other than that, um, I'm currently in the process of you know tracking down uh, a few more writings, both both of himself and of um, of the people who, in one way or another, um, engaged with him. So uh, this might also like uh, require. Uh, I could also need some some uh, some help in this. Mm. And um, of course, uh, yeah, um, constituting and, and producing um, the text will also uh, require help from like proofreaders, for example, especially native uh, English speakers. As well, if like I've put so many hours, I don't know, hundreds if not thousands of hours into into. Uh, this uh, research already and I don't want the finished text to look like it was put together by a 12 year old with Microsoft Word <laughs> so if, if there's someone who um, uh, is an expert on on um, like how you call it like typesetting mm. um, yeah please uh, can touch like I'm still uh, I'm still learning but I want this to to um, be uh, professionally um, mm. usable as well and I suspect that Koenig's um, historical value, like as a historical um, figure with this um, educational project, might actually um, be greater than his uh, like purely intellectual value. Yeah. So, so I think there are a lot of um, people who might take an interest in him um, as a person, especially, as I said, in this um, uh, cosmopolitan pacifist movement, but also like um, more recently, there has been a resurgence uh, interest in uh, the life and work of people like Magnus Hirschfeld and other pioneers of um, you know the early um, uh, gay rights movement and this was clearly a movement that Koenig also in one way or another participated in so mm -hmm. this might also be uh, something uh, worth exploring like from 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 that point of view yeah so for anyone that has listened to that and does want to reach out to well e either either of you to make a contribution or ask questions or anything like that. Um, I will get some form of contact from you both and put it in the description of the video. And uh, if nothing else, my email is always in the description of the video so they can email me and I can put them in contact. Um, but before we finish, are there any closing things you want to say that you feel like we've maybe missed in the other questions or anything about Koenig you want to quickly add in at the end? Um, Karim, if, if you go first. Yeah, perhaps we can ask, uh, are there today any lessons to be learned from Koenig? 
apart from his antinatalism. And in my view, it is his uh, anti-militarism. Anti because today we are in a world situation of ever-growing tensions. Some people say um, all this could end up in a third world war. So mm -hmm. lessons from, to be learned from Koenig are perhaps um, we should engage more, as he did and as a role model to all of us, for all of us, engage in pacifistic movements. Uh, I, for one, I'm, I'm, I'm a, I am a member of a, of a peace movement and uh, I tr try to combine, combine antinatalism and pacifism um, to be an outspoken, uh, to endorse uh, pacifism or out, extremely outspokenly. So that, in my mind, is a lesson to be learned from, mm. from Gordick. And Lenny, do you have any closing thoughts before we finish? Yeah, I think that it is very um, important. Uh, like, if you su subscribe to any sort of um, ideology, to know that you are, your ideas that you might consider to be revolutionary or anything are not really new. Everything has been thought before. Everything has been attempted um, before, and it's good to know who your um, like spiritual or intellectual or ideological um, predecessors were and um, what they did at which conclusions they arrived and also why they failed or why they were um, successful and uh, for Koenig it is really in his cases it's really interesting because um, on the one hand he seemed to be like completely isolated with the views that he had that were so radically different um, from the views of his contemporaries. We talked about his views on, on sexuality, uh, his views on militarism, his views on procreation, there were a lot of these. Um, but nonetheless, um, um, it is uh, in interesting to see um, like w what, how they were received and um, kind of what, what kind of uh, a role they had in the intellectual landscape of their time. But nonetheless, um, I would also like to uh, remind myself and remind people like not to mystify him or, or glorify mm -hmm. him. So he was a, a writer with uh, some s severe, uh, I mean, with his biases, of course, but also um, with his uh, with his limitations. So it's um, sometimes we tend to to exalt or glorify um, people or call them great thinkers simply because they agree with us when we are yeah. actually just congratulating ourselves. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, this is specifically why I think it is so important to engage with the actual source material. And I encourage um, each and everyone to, to actually engage with the source material, read um, what you can read and um, make up your own mind on, um, on the topic. And uh, if you are interested in the work of Koenig, um, then that you'll find a lot of useful resources linked in the description yeah. below. I myself um, uploaded a number of uh, scans uh, uh, of his work into archive.org. And uh, yeah, please uh, yeah. reach out and... Uh, yeah, so Lenny, Lenny has compiled a bunch of links. I'll get any links from you as well, Karim, and those will all be in the description. So there will be, you know, the, the mother of all <laughs> lists of links in the description on Koenig um, so people can access that. But um, yeah, I think we can close it there. And I just want to say thank you both so much for thank you. one, doing this, but also like your research into Koenig and helping to uncover someone who I think is going to be really valuable to know about in the antinatalist world. So thank you, thank you so, so much. much for your work. Thank you.